Good morning and welcome to today's CFDA professional development workshop in partnership with BlueSign. I'm Sasha Brown, the Director of Professional Development, and it's my pleasure to introduce Kevin Mayette, who is the Director of Global Services at BlueSign. Through this workshop, Kevin will help you understand the impacts associated with your product and supply network, share some of the biggest obstacles towards improvement, and provide practical steps so you can best accelerate your actions to drastically reduce your environmental impact. Please note that we will be launching several polls throughout Kevin's presentation. Um, we hope you participate and your participation will be anonymous. We'll also be hosting a Q&A at the end of the hour, so please feel free to submit your questions uh, via the Q&A tab. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to hand this over to Kevin. Thank you. Um, thanks for joining today. Um, I'm going to share my screen here and go into presentation mode. Cool. I'm assuming we're good. Um, thanks for joining uh, and I appreciate uh, the opportunity to, to, to talk to you today a bit about um, my brand, my network, my impact. Um, clearly, there is a, uh, a host of things that you need to be aware of as you go, uh, navigate the path of really understanding what it is uh, that your biggest impacts are and, and where they come from and how to actually mitigate, understand them and mitigate them. This is a, you know, we live in an island surrounded by a sea of ignorance. As our island of knowledge grows, so does the shore of our ignorance. Um, John Archibald Wheeler, John Archibald Wheeler said that, um, I put this against a, uh, an advertisement from Humble Oil, the precursor to Exxon, um, uh, the company we know as Exxon today, Exxon Mobil. Um, this was written and developed in 1962. And if we knew back in 1962, it wasn't probably a good idea to talk about the fact that each day Humble supplies enough energy to melt 7 million tons of glacier. I don't know what is a good example of, of our knowledge growing and wishing we had a chance to do this over again. My name is Kevin Mayette. I'm the Director of Global Brand Services for Blue Sign Technologies. Um, and uh, you can see my contact information on the page. Uh, this is actually, uh, I live in Sisters, Oregon, which is a small uh, community in the uh, center of, of Oregon. Um, this is literally my backyard um, uh, or close to it. Uh, um, and I live in the uh, traditional territory of the Wasco, uh, Warm Springs and Northern Paiutes people. And I, I, I'm thankful every day for um, uh, the wonderful uh, uh, region that I get to uh, live in. I work for a company called Blue Sign Technologies. Um, uh, it's a Swiss-based uh, organization that, um, you know, the, the mission is to, you know, unite the entire textile value chain to reduce impact on people on the planet. You know, it started as a project back in 90, 1990, uh, and, uh, and it is, uh, was founded as a, uh, uh, as a company in, the, in, in around the year 2000. We have over what we refer to as system partners. We have over 730 of them worldwide, and we have offices all over the world because we're very as you will see, we're very connected to the supply network. Um, and we have about, I haven't kept track of ex the exact number, but I think we're about 100 employees or so worldwide. Blue Sign, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time about Blue Sign today because we're going to actually talk a little lot more about impact, but, but it's important to give you a little bit of context of who we are as Blue Sign. Um, I know there's some, uh, some uh, set up. Uh, um, office hours that um, a colleague of mine will be um, manning uh, for uh, for those who want to learn a little bit more about BlueSign. But in a sense, th think of BlueSign, we're a system. But, you know, we, we many may think of us as a certification, but reality is what we do is we build a system that builds better product all the way back to the molecule. So we have companies that are chemical suppliers who are part of our system, and we have a direct relationship with them. We have those who make materials who are part of our system, and we have direct relationships to them. And we also have brands who are part of our system. And, and that's the part area of the organization that, that I work. 
um, is working with the brands. In, a set, in, in essence, what we do is we really spend what I would refer to as quality assurance. We make sure that companies are competent at what they do. So a chemical supplier makes chemistry and we're, we're very in tune with how do you make chemistry and ultimately what kind of chemistry should be made and what shouldn't be in that chemistry. And only when all of that comes together do we have what we refer to as blue sun approved chemistry. And you can see it flows through the system. Um, those who, who make materials need chemistry to make materials. So we spend an equal amount of time working with the manufacturers of materials and understand what, how they go about making product and, and including the fact that all the chemicals that go into the system don't necessarily come out with a bulk roll of fabric. A lot of them are air emissions or water emissions and we manage that really, really carefully. Um, and then we look at all the different chemistries come in so that ultimately when you see a blue sign approved material, if you're a material developer and you see a header card and it says blue sign approved, um, you have everything upstream that's included in that whole process. And then lastly, we work with brands and we deeply assess brands where they are on their journey in what I refer to as chemical integrity and then determine what are the things that could be improved upon? What are the best practices in that space? And then ultimately help them get to better practices and then work with them to do a better job of material selection and building a better supply chain. So you may know some of these chemical companies that are part of our system. This is just a subsection of, of, of organizations that are part of the Blue Sign Network. Um, you probably know a lot more of the manufacturers. Again, just a subsection of the uh, of the total of manufacturers. Um, but you definitely know a lot of the brands who are part of the Blue Sign Network. Um, you know, this is this these are the organizations that I get to work with on a regular basis, day to day to day basis, in fact. Uh, and uh, and some of them are very far along in their journey on on addressing chemical integrity and sustainability. And some are actually relatively new. We have organizations that um, recognize that um, the work that we do is going to really, really accelerate their programs. And so, so they become part of our system and then we're gonna spend a little time talking about some of the stuff that we do with them uh, in a minute because we'll actually be doing some of it with you. So, Enough directly about blue sign. We're going to talk. A little, we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about the textile, apparel, and footwear sectors' impact responsibility. So I just get back from um, Singapore. In fact, uh, from the uh, Sustainable Apparel Coalition meeting. For those who are familiar with the Sustainable Apparel Coalition and the HIG Index, um, and there was a tremendous amount of conversation, tremendous amount of energy and effort around what is the industry's impact. And how do we continually work to reduce it? And whatever, what's our responsibility? Is it something that is voluntary or is this something that is absolutely going to be a, a requirement of doing business as, as usual? Um, if you have not read it, please download and read the Roadmap to Net Zero, um, a document produced by the WRI and the Parallel Impact Institute. Um, and, and there's a few tidbits I want to pull out of here that I think are really, really important. First of all, uh, unexpected, I mean, as expected, our industry's impact continues to grow. When we're talking about carbon right now, I mean, there's lots of other impacts. We're going to talk about carbon dioxide and our carbon dioxide equivalent or greenhouse gas em uh, emissions. Unchecked, our, 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 our impact is going to grow from about a, a one gigaton up to one and a half gigatons by 2030. And this puts us well off of a target of keeping the industry and, and our contribution, which is around 2% of annual global greenhouse gas emissions to the 1.5 degree target. And so this is really, really important. We need to really figure out how we're going to continually to do our part as an industry to um, address this huge challenge. Um, this Graph tells it all. It shows, I and mean, the base year for the calculation was 2019. So in 2019, we had about a gigaton in our industry. Um, the goal, okay, if, if we do, if we actually, business as usual is going to get us to one and a half gigatons by 2030. The goal is half of where we currently are. 
So you see these diverging, these diverging lines. Um, we, you know, we need to get to half of where we are, not double where we are, or one and a half times where we are. Um, so, um, and, and now it's 2022. Um, so we're probably closer to 1.2. So that line's even steeper. Um, you know, at the uh, 2019 base year, we need a 45% reduction in our greenhouse gases to keep our industry on path to, to one and a half degree target. So um, we've identified a whole bunch of interventions that we could do if, if absolute best case scenarios. And that just alone is not even gonna get us half to where we need to be if we did everything right. Um, and, and I guarantee you, we have not done that yet. So again, uh, the, the, every year, the order gets even taller in how we address this challenge. Um, even with the best interventions, there's still a gap from where we need to be to keep on this one and a half degree uh, pathway. So if, if this doesn't you know, burnish in your mind, we've got a lot of work to do, um, then I don't know what does. So a lot of organizations are stepping up to the plate and they have uh, done what's called uh, science-based targets. So they actually have calculated their, their actual footprint. Um, we'll get to that in a second. Um, and they've actually made plans. They've, they've through clear pro protocol, following protocol, have actually calculated what they need to get to. And here's some of the, the, the targets, um, you know, about 50, this is as of this summer, um, which was the 2021 reporting year, um, there were 50 brands with targets, um, approved targets, because these get approved by the, uh, the, 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 um, uh, the organization, SBTI. Um, and half of them had scope three targets. We'll talk a little bit about what that is in a second. Um, that's where the biggest impact is. Um, and you'll see the range, 63% reduction by ASICs and 15% by Brooks. The average for all of these organizations was a reduction of 33%. Now that's the thing that, that we get there. Remember, we need to be at 45. So, you know, e these are the best of the best that are doing this work here and we're not, we're not even at what we need to be for targets. The good news is that continually, we're seeing a great growth of organizations that are engaging in this process. Um, you know, the number of brands with a commitment to, 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 to the science-based targets has grown dramatically. And the actual ones with, um, um, approved targets, it was 50 in the year before, we're up to over 110 and it's growing rapidly. So just everything we've talked about right now, science-based targets are a voluntary initiative. Um, there is absolutely reason to be aware that um, some of this is, people would, would argue it's a moral imperative that we do this here, but there is definitely legislation that's saying we need to be doing this here because in the great state of New York, um, we see uh, moving forward, whether this fully comes to fruition or not, it's, it's a precursor to what we're going to see across, whether it's New York or California or, or um, probably not at a federal level, um, but, but the, this Fashion Sustainability and Social Accountability Act is very clear, you need to know who your suppliers are. You need to know your network really well. And then you need to have um, uh, defined what your impact is and define a baseline and develop your reduction targets. So this is, this is uh, this, you know, it, there's a threshold at what the brand must be doing in uh, as, a, as a global brand, as far as your volume. Um, but uh, but uh, the threshold is around 100 million or so. Um, but the thing is, um, whether or not you're over that threshold or not, it's a precursor of what things are coming. Because if you don't meet the New York State one, but if you sell into Europe, um, there's equal amounts of, of effort happening in the uh, Europe, in the uh, EU due diligence. And this is the all EU. There's individual ones in Germany and the, and the Nordics as well. So if the message here is the writing's on the wall. We need to be, as organizations, it's more than simply just making product. We need to be aware of our impacts and we need to be addressing them. The huge challenge with impact is that most of these calculations are 
a, are in fact a calculation. They're, they're an estimate because, and we'll get to in a, a second about, about data, um, but much of the data is not coming directly from your own network. It's coming from industry calculations and industry averages. Um, and, and this is the best that we can do right now because getting to data is really, really challenging. Now, there are guidelines to do this. Um, you know, the Carbon Disclosure Project is, is and, 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 and based on what's called the Greenhouse Gas Protocols, um, have made it clear how you go about doing this. The challenges, and this, I love this quote from McKinsey and Company, one of the companies that it's actually making a lot of money doing a lot of carbon accounting, said, one of their experts said, you know, this could be plus or minus 30%. Can you imagine doing your, your financials plus or minus 30%? Um, so the degree of accuracy is not incredibly high. Um, it's not a reason to not do it, but just be aware that this is a part, this is a reality of how we go about um, this process right now. The important thing to remember is that once you've done this calculation, um, you don't improve on a theoretical, you improve on the actual. So eventually you need to get to actual actual, what's the actual impact of your own network in order to be able to do that? And the industry is desperate for what we refer to as primary data. What that is that? Primary data is data provided by the suppliers or other value chain partners related to the specific activities in the reporting company's value chain. Most of what we're using is what's called secondary data. And that's industry average data from published databases, government statistics, literature, a whole bunch of other sources that actually come together to give us the best estimation of what impacts are. So if you take your volume, your intensity, and you multiply it times a industry average, you end up with a good um, or a good enough uh, uh, estimation of what your actual impact is. So we're going to shift gears a little bit, and we're going to talk about what's called the supply network, um, because you'll understand a bit more about why we get to some of these foundational things that we work with brands on, um, because calculating your footprint, yes, you may want to be doing that, but before you even get to that, there's some foundational things that you should be doing as an organization. So I love this quote, I would not give a fig for the simplicity, this side of complexity, but I would give my life for the simplicity on the other side of complexity. We like things simplified for us. We like, we, we don't deal well in complexity, but the fact is the world is complex and the supply network that we work in is complex. So it's important, to, what Oliver Wendell Holmes is saying is, it's important to understand that so that we can simplify where do we focus. So this, this diagram, um, and you can download a copy here if this, if this intrigues you, uh, is something that we've used throughout the industry. Um, it continues to evolve. It's actually technically the industry's diagram. It, people refer to oftentimes as my diagram. It's not. Um, uh, I may be the steward of it, but it's really the industry's diagram. And it's stylized. So you have brands, you have retailers, and you have some brands that are retailers and retailers that are brands. And this is a, um, a just a, a natural occurrence uh, as we had as we go into more e-commerce e and all that. We have many brands who become retailers, and and vice versa. Um, pretty straightforward stuff. What we refer to as tier one is where finished goods come together. Um, it's a, a complex na uh, network of large suppliers, small suppliers, and a lot of sub suppliers, a lot of subcontracting that goes on in this space. We have our tier two. This is so complex, we've even broken down into two pieces, um, which we're weaving, knitting, non woving, a lot of that beginning forming a material takes place, um, and then dyeing coding, finishing, lamination, all the things that are at the latter stage of, of finished material. And again, remember, there is a fair amount of subcontracting that's going on in this space as well. Tier three is where materials begin to take their shape in yarn spinning and feathers and down processing and film and tape manufacturing and the formation of metals and plastics and things like that in their, in their raw form before they become the final component that goes into our products. 
And then tier four is where we have, uh, we, we refer to this as our feedstock area, where we get raw materials, whether it be from, uh, you know, from uh, extractive industry or, uh, or, uh, or farming or animal husbandry, what have you, we have that part of the network. We also see with, a lot, with the advent of a lot more recycling, um, remember that uh, recycling comes back into the network into tier four. Um, uh, because that's where you have the recycled materials and the reprocessing of these materials that ultimately bring it back to a feedstock. There are two layers missing in this diagram here. I'm going to fill them in. Um, they're really important. Agents, trade, trading companies, and licensees. Um, depending upon your business model, you may or may not have these as part of your network. Um, and some of them are really good. There, Some of them are really big, and they, they basically, they are they can run anything from design to sourcing to uh, a full package of being able to provide you, I've got an idea, and they execute it on your behalf. Um, and then there's this thing we refer to, and you may have different names for this, we refer to it commonly as a material converter. And think of it as kind of an agent or trading company, but just for materials. Their specialty is materials. And, and they may not have manufacturing facilities, but they know where to get materials manufactured. And that's their special sauce. That's what they deliver to you as a brand. Why this diagram is actually important is that we actually look at chemistry as well. Chemistry is not tier five. Chemistry is a different, entire, entirely uh, um, uh, uh, different and, and feeding into the textile network um, network of itself. And so you can see that at tier one, if you're doing denim, you have a lot of chemistry that comes in in the laundry uh, phase. If you're doing tier two, there's, this, is a, this is where the lion's share of chemistry comes in in the textile world, because everything from oils, from knit, uh, knitting and weaving to dyes, prints, coating, all of that it's an enormous amount of chemistry needed there. Tier three, there's chemistry there as well. Um, surfactants, um, uh, uh, lubricants, all those things that are necessary for that process. Um, and then in tier four, in extractive industries, I mean, you could have uh, oil and gas, you have a lot of chemistry necessary for that. And then farming, um, you may have pesticides, herbicides, and a whole bunch of other things that come into the network there. So there are four layers that we identify in the chemical world. Um, uh, the first layer is kind of like a converter. Um, the second layer is where chemicals are actually mixed. And the third layer is where actual new molecules are being made. So this is where synthesis occurs. This is when you think of traditional chemistry, it's deep in that network that actual chemicals are made as opposed to simply just resold or mixed. And then way upstream, you have the uh, area where chemistry is, it, it's in raw form. And you, this is where ExxonMobil, the company I, I shared at the very beginning, um, plays because they're very big, not just in producing uh, energy, but they're also big in producing the chemistry, the feedstocks that actually make the chemistry for our world. And so you are here. If you're a brand, you are here. And you can see it is a complex network that, um, you exist in. So this is a handy diagram because when we start talking about impact, we can actually layer onto this where the biggest impacts are. Um, uh, from an energy perspective, you'll start to see this, this pattern here. Um, not a lot of energy necessary at the brand retailer component when you compare it to where materials are made where materials are made, particularly tier two. If you combine both layers of tier two, you've got nearly 50% of the energy necessary to produce a, 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 a product uh, in, uh, uh, in, in our space. From a water perspective, again, tier two shows up as where the primary impacts are. Obviously, there's a fair amount of water used in tier four, whether it's in agriculture or in extractive industries, um, but Again, you get a good sense of where the big impacts are. Um, and from a climate perspective, again, back to tier two, 48% of the impact or nearly half of the impact is gonna happen right there where the materials are finished, you know, from woven to uh, actual finished materials. So when we talk about recycling, so those of you who say, hey, we've gone circular and 
a big part of your circular strategy is recycling, great, fantastic. But remember where recycling materials come back into the network. It comes back here in tier four. And many of the processes and most of the impact occurs after tier four. So great that you're offsetting the impact of virgin materials, but it's not enough. You have to be aware of the rest of the, of the, of the process to be able to address this. And most of the processes, um, particularly in tier two, are gonna have a lot more impact. Um, and chemistry, so when you talk about circularity, chemistry is anything but circular. In fact, it's most commonly, we refer to as take, use, dump. So most of the chemistry used in textiles does not end up in the bulk roll of fabric or in that yarn. It's, it's, it's a process chemical. In fact, about 90% of it is process chemistry. It either has an air emission, a water emission, and most likely is not being recycled and is something that needs to be dealt with. So a little bit about your impact as a brand, and you may hear the terms uh, scopes of impact um, and particularly scope one, scope two, scope three. Um, there's a lot of brands who have, done, have deeply studied what their impact is. So this is, this is about an average. Some may say it's high as, uh, higher than this and some may it's, say it's lower than this here, but on average, where your biggest impact is going to occur is what we refer to as scope three. So scope one is your direct impact, your direct discharge. You may be heating your buildings. You may be doing things that, that have a direct impact to climate. Um, scope two is purchased energy. Um, so it's, most of it's gonna be electricity, but it could be steam and a few other things depending upon um, your, your business model. Scope three is, is this huge category. In fact, there's, a, there's 15 different other subcategories in this area that um, uh, where most of the impact, and just think of it as, as a brand, this is your product and the supply network that provides it. Because if you further break down scope three by category, 80% of it is what we refer to as category one or purchased goods and services. So most of the impact is embedded in the products that you are delivering to the market. And if you further break down uh, scope uh, three uh, into the supply chain tiers, remember, we, as we just talked about, 52% of it is gonna happen right there in tier two. So if you were to do nothing, if you knew nothing about your carbon footprint, you could actually make a difference by really focusing on your tier two, because that's where the lion's share of your impact resides. So when we talk about carbon footprinting, you know, I love this diagram because, you know, and it's kind of uh, apropos because we just finished the World Series. If our goal is home plate to know exactly what our footprint is, our hope is that we're in the park. But the reality is we're probably somewhere out in the bay. Uh, and, and our challenge is to get better and to really use better knowledge, better information and work hard at this here. So this brings us to the, the whole part of the, um, of the, uh, uh, the session. So I do this thing called the Blue Sign Brand Assessment. And so what, what it is, is our, um, we work with each and every one of our brands and we deeply assess where they are in their journey. And it has a, a number of different things that help us actually provide to them clarity on where their gaps are and how they actually get better. Here's a diagram of the of the the process. We work with brand, you know, we do a self assessment. We work actually um, work with them directly uh, on site on the brand assessment. We produce a gap analysis for you know where they are versus what are best practices and what are minimal practices in the space. And then we work with them to develop strategy and actually self improve. Here's the categories of the things that we talk about that are a part of the the session. Um, from foundational, what's your vision, your strategy, policies, management systems, to really deeply knowing supply network, really deeply knowing materials. Um, we only get to chemistry four steps down. We don't start with chemistry. Um, we actually, once you realize how challenging those first three are, um, you understand how challenging it is in part for chemical management. And then we work with them to see how you engage with your network and then ultimately goals and progress and communications.
we had the pleasure and the privilege of uh, assessing some of the best brands in the world here. Um, this is this is I, I love this slide because it's a it's a who's who of organizations that some have you know very far along in their process. Some are still relatively new in the process, but the the, the commonality is they're working towards improving. So what we're going to do is we're going to jump into what I refer to as a mini brand assessment now. And I, I realized we sent to you guys in advance a, um, uh, a, um, a, a paper, a, a homework assignment. And so um, we're going to go through these questions one by one. Um, and there's only, there's only six. We're not, this, is a, this is a mini, mini, mini subset of the, of the broader assessment. But it's going, to, it's going to help us understand some of the foundations that are necessary to be able to address these huge challenges that I shared with at the beginning of the conversation. So question number one, and you may, you may say, oh, well, of course, we know this. This is something that we do. Um, but I, I encourage you to be honest here. And in fact, when I work with brands, um, it's really important that they do understand that this is confidential. I'm not the goal isn't to impress me, the goal is to get to accuracy. So question number one um, is, our brand's um, business model uses value chain services such as agents, trading companies, and or material converters to source and develop products and materials. And so uh, simple answer, uh, yes, no, partial yes, I don't know. And question number two on the same um, Poll is going to be our brand has clearly documented communicated policy which requires all sources used by value chain services, if used, are disclosed to the brand and documented. So is the is the poll up right now? Oh, we had. Oh, I guess the I guess the question wasn't open long enough. Um, we had one response. Um, uh, no worries. We will think about your answer to this question here. Think about your answer. We'll 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 get we'll 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 get that. Um, Sorry, I just relaunched the poll. If everyone wants to participate. Oh, okay. Cool. Know. Cool. Good. Awesome. We're good. There We're you good. go. Everyone has a couple a minute to. Submit. Yeah, let's, we'll just give you a minute. It shouldn't take you long to answer these questions. It, they're, they're pretty straightforward. But I encourage you to be clear, open, honest. Again, this is all confidential uh, or anonymous. We need, to, we need Jeopardy music in the... Uh, That's probably long enough. Hopefully everybody has been able to. Okay, cool, great. Uh, so I see our brand's business model uses value chain service. Yes, 14%, no, 29%, partially yes, 29%, don't know, 29%. So um, yeah, I think that uh, is a, um, a pretty fair uh, perspective. Um, so second question more and almost as important is if we do, um, uh, do we have a policy and do we actually make it a policy that they need to be clear as to where they're producing those products and materials? No is 29%, is partial yes, um, one there, and don't know is, is, is four. I believe that to be true because when my working with brands, um, there's a lot that um, is really a challenge in this space. So just a little bit of background here, supply network intermediaries. Remember those are the agents and trading companies and material converters that are part of the network. Um, agents and trading companies are not a bad thing. In fact, some of them are critical if you're a small brand to actually get the leverage you need to actually produce your product. So this is not saying that they're a bad thing. And many people say, no, we don't use them as a badge of no, we're, we're actually better. The reality is good ones are actually really good. 
and they actually provide you transparency. However, secretive ones create huge barriers to your transparency. Um, you know, in some brands, I see that their, their trading companies even prevent access to their own bill of materials. And so, and, and, and bill of materials are gonna be necessary in actually doing this work. From a converter perspective, this is really interesting because I work with a lot of brands and many say, we don't use converters. Well, on average, on average, for all the brands that we work with, it's around 15 to 16% of their supply network are converters. And sometimes they don't even know that they're a converter because they approach them and say, hey, we can make this material for you. They don't know that they don't actually have facilities. Some brands we see as high as 25% or more of their network is our converters. So converters are also not a bad thing if they're managed and have you have a great, because some of the converters will get you materials that you will never ever find on your own. So using them is not a bad strategy. However, opaque ones create huge challenges for transparency. Um, there's likely more conversion happening in your network than you're aware of. And a best practice is to develop a relationship, trust that where disclosure is mandatory for the partnership. However, remember trust is a two-way thing. Um, they may trust you, but uh, or you may trust them, but, but they need to trust you as well. So second question, um, and there's, this is actually four questions because it's gonna be done by tier. Our brand is keenly aware of the suppliers that are part of our supply network, regardless if they've been explicitly chosen by us, tier one, tier two, tier three, tier four. So go ahead. And again, um, so there's gonna be four questions that have, um, um, relative to the specific uh, uh, level of the, of the network. And we'll just give you a minute or so. Remember tier one, finished goods, tier two, material component manufacturing, tier three is where raw materials begin their processing and tier four is extractive and recycling. Who are they? Who are these organizations? Well, we go ahead and I think that should be long enough. Why don't we see what the results are here. So yes, tier one, uh, uh, not surprising that you, that, in fact, you should definitely know if you don't know your tier one, that's a challenge. Uh, uh, partially yes, don't know, uh, it, uh, falls into that space there. Uh, tier two, yes, um, we'll get to some of that right now in a minute, but that it, it is absolutely a good thing. In fact, it's not easy to know and really manage your tier two. Um, uh, and then tier three, um, getting to know more likely. Uh, yes, you're starting to get really deep in that supply network. Uh, and tier four, um, generally, you know your tier four if it's a special material, it's an organic cotton, it's a recycled material, it's, you know, it meets some very clear um, attributes that are, are specific in that space. And more and more now with disclosure and the issues with, um, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the um, uh, forced labor in the supply network, including farming, um, knowing that is actually really important. So let's move on. The next question, which is, okay, great, I know who they are, but do I know where they are? Who specifically are these facilities that are doing this work? It could be very, very different. So the first question is who they are. The second question is where they are. And I'll give you a little bit of ex uh, explanation on um, my experience with the brands on this particular question.
Now, when we say where they are, we're talking about the actual facilities, the actual location of the facility, not the head office, the actual facility. Okay, why don't we go ahead and see what the responses are. Yes, for tier one, 100%. Um, uh, four out of five for uh, tier two. Um, obviously drops off into tier three. Um, and then tier four, one says yes. And um, uh, most are saying no or partially yes, or just don't know. Well, we've spent a lot of time working with brands on these very points. And, and, and it's really important to know not just who they are, but where they are. Um, and, and oftentimes um, uh, what we discover is that the information is, isn't as good as you think that it might be. Um, why is this? Well, facility is a different name from the headquarters. The supply of the multiple facilities, the vendor, there's often a factory source materials in some cases. Um, the, and there's just a litany of reasons why um, that knowing the actual location of the facilities is not a part of it. Um, when you consider tier one, this is just for vendor source materials, you know, depending on your business model, a, a, a number of your materials might be specified by your tier one. Um, you know, these are often commodities like threads, basic materials, pocketing, interlining, things like that, sometimes the trims. The source of these materials are often change very frequently. Um, and, and brands often do not know who these suppliers are. Um, 100% nomination is not necessarily best practice for organization. However, managing these expectations for the vendor source materials is. Um, and you need a strong quality and compliance program um, to be able to manage this very, very effectively. Because if, if, in effect, the tier one is going to operate as you to make sure that they are doing the best work. So um, next question, subcontracting and outsourcing. Our brand has clearly documented and communicated a policy which ensures that subcontracting, this is someone, I know who my mill is, I know who my manufacturer is, but they may be some subcontracting. So I have a policy that says, that says all subcontracting is disclosed to you um, or a third party on your behalf. This is a pretty quick question. Why don't we go ahead and see what the responses are for that. Uh, a couple say yes, um, a couple say no, and one not sure, don't know. Um, this is important. If you think that subcontracting is not happening, um, then uh, it's, uh, it's, a bit of a folly, especially at tier two. Because if you take the, the major processes, just the wet processes at tier two, dyeing to uh, you know, uh, finishing, to coating, lamination, printing, all this. And then you take also the pretreatment processes, desizing, scouring, bleaching, all of that. If you look at the actual outsourcing that happens, so we know this because this is blue sign, and we know not just who the manufacturer of material is, but if they're doing any outsourcing, because we have to do complete analysis of everything. 13% um, of all pretreatment is being outsourced. 8% 8, 8 of finishing is being outsourced. 13% um, of coating and lamination is being outsourced. 21% of printing is being outsourced. And almost a quarter of all dyeing that is happening in the network that we, that we manage is being outsourced. Again. Not a problem if you're really managing this well, but if you don't know that it's happening and you don't have clarity around it, it's a problem. Um, outsourcing is not a bad thing. It's often the way textiles are made. Unknown or unmanaged outsourcing, however, is a real challenge for transparency and traceability. Okay, last questions. Um, managing supplier data. A process to collect and manage supply, detailed supplier data includes 
First question, a clearly defined responsibility found in specific job descriptions or role within your organization. And it also, you have a regular and reliable managed repository of this information, either in a single database or an integrated set of data sets or what have you. This is basically saying, not only do we manage it, but we really clearly have process around managing this information. Give it just another few more minutes or a few more seconds here. We go ahead and see what the response is. Yes, 38% say yes. 25% uh, uh, say no. Uh, partially yes, don't know. I would say that the real correct answer to this question, first question, if anything, is a partial yes, because it's a hard job. In fact, many times people say, Kevin, we need a person in sustainability. And my first response is supply chain analyst. Uh, one of the first and most important things that you need to do. Um, second question is, um, we have actual database to do this here. Uh, one of you say yes. Um, uh, most are saying no. And this is, this is not uncommon. In fact, the most common da database or data structure is Excel. And it's a cobbled together system. The challenge is, as you see this complexity of the supply network, it's difficult to manage. And so you're not alone if you don't have a database. Um, but, um, but having clarity and management and actually investing in this process is really, really important. Cool. So what do we see? You know, so in the, our assessment of brands in this space, um, we have we have we rank and rate the brands again all anonymously. Um, you can see to the right um, in our brand assessment, and remember the brands we were working with. Only a few of them are, are what we refer to as a, at a developing stage. Absolutely nobody's progressive and nobody's aspirational. Most are foundational or underperforming. This is a real challenge because it doesn't necessarily fall in an area. Of responsibility is it the materials manager is it the sourcing manager is it the quality manager is it the sustainability manager who's responsible for this here where does it fall in my organization so think about that there's also no one size fits all information system um, uh, whether it's plm or erp or these traceability systems is blockchain going to help us solve this problem um, most people use excel um, this is improving as far as unique ids um, open Apparel Registry is now called the Open Supply Hub, I think it is. Um, it just changed name last week. But it's really good because it's providing a unique ID for every single supplier in the network. And the most important thing is there's not usually enough commitment to prioritize this task, be done adequately in the face of all other things that we need to do. So I'm just going to go through this really quickly because I want to leave time for questions. Um, you know, I love this quote, it isn't what you know, know that gets you into trouble, it's what you know for sure that just isn't so. Um, oftentimes, the best thing to do is just get out a blank map and start the process and build your supply network. Um, I can give you a blank copy of this diagram if you'd like. Um, do this for some of your products and spend the time to actually build your perspective on your network because it's not easy. So I want to finish with a couple of recommendations. Um, make supply network intelligence and management a top priority in your organization. You need to assign the role very clearly to individual, individu uh, to an individual or individuals with that accountability and where you can support with appropriate systems. Develop and implement a strategy for all supply chain intermediaries, trading companies, agents, licensees, converters. And you need to establish 100% transparency with their suppliers. This is not going to be easy. Sometimes it's going to require some change in relationships. Um, develop an outsourcing management program. 
particularly for your tier one and tier two. You, you, you don't necessarily say, don't do it. You just have to manage it and know where things are happening. This is interesting. People say, well, I know all materials. Generally, they don't. You need to be able to be precise about your materials down to the fiber types, even for materials you don't specify. And then know your consumption because we're not gonna even get to impact. Primary data, when we talk about impact, is going to have to be matched up against your volumes in order to be able to know what your specific impact is to get away from this calculated, estimated um, impact. And if you've calculated your footprint, great. It's likely inaccurate, but that shouldn't stop you. Um, you need to continue to improve this over time. And you can decide if the, 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 the science-based targets is right for you. A lot of organizations are moving down that path, but know that if you go down that route, it's public. Um, and lastly, carbon offsets distract you from the real work. I mean, this is a personal perspective. I'm not alone in this here. Every ounce of effort should be made towards carbon reduction, not offsetting. So with that, we reach the end of the trail and we have a few minutes left here. If there's any questions that um, I can help answer. Thank you, Kevin. That was incredibly comprehensive. We have one question um, and this uh, relates to one of your earlier diagrams pre the poll. So um, you might remember which one. Okay. And our question is, where would using dead stock materials fall in this line? And I know our, our guest was speaking to. Oh, specific. that's a great question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect. Great question. So dead stock material is a wonderful, wonderful option. Um, so here's the diagram. Dead stock material is basically been through all of this. It's been through all of this space here. So um, technically it's material that has already been produced. So all the impacts are already embedded into it. So it's post tier two. Um, you know, you still need to build the finished material, finished product. So the impacts that are associated with building a finished product at tier one are there. But everything from tier four to tier three to tier two and all the chemistry, unless you're doing laundry at tier one, is already embedded into the dead stock. And it's why dead stock is actually, if, you, if it's a part of your strategy, it's, it's actually useful. You know, there are organizations, I've worked with many organizations that are using dead stock um, it's interesting because oftentimes they, it's, it's, I mean, there's a fair amount of it out there, but you can quickly surpass the, the volumes um, in that space there. But, but if it's a strategy you can make work within your organization, great. Perfect. Um, I ha the next question is, I've heard about fabric mills that are overproducing textiles so that they can sell them as dead stock. Have you heard of this or have any concerns about it? Um, there is a, yes, there's a lot of things that are, um, uh, it, whenever there is a, uh, a, 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 an action or, or, or an initiative to, to improve things, there's always people and organizations that are willing to take advantage of that. And so um, uh, I haven't heard of specifically XYZ mill is doing this, but this doesn't surprise me. Um, you know, this is why it's critically important that you're working with high quality, high, um, uh, com highly committed organizations that are um, on the pathway towards improvement. And there are many indicators of what when a supplier is of this high quality. And if you, one of the things that we do in this whole process of brand assessment is we, we, um, we work with you to ensure that you've got good, um, uh, a, a good scorecard in place. And what really makes up a great scorecard when you actually work with your network. And there's many, it's, and it needs to be multi-dimensional. It's not simply environmental and social responsibility. It is a whole host of other things from innovation to what have you, because you want a multi-dimensional scorecard. But um, when you have clarity of your network, who they are, where they are, and then you're actually measuring that, then you are in much better shape to be able to weed out the ones that are gonna try to 
uh, provide the network with uh, uh, with something. I mean, it's not just manufactured dead stock. It's 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 is it really recycled? You can go further upstream, which is even harder to know, Thanks. unless you're doing the art. Those who are following the the the, the RDS um, um, certification. Any other questions? Those were the two that were submitted, but I just want to remind everyone who's joining us today that on November 21st, another member of the Blue Sign team is hosting office hours. So if you want to talk about your brand, your company um, in a more private setting, one on one with um, someone from Blue Sign, please, we encourage you to sign up um, for a the last few time slots we have available, I'll be sending um, a recap later today with that information on how to sign up. So once again, Kevin, thank you so much for this incredible presentation today and wishing everyone health and wellness as we sign off. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day, everybody. Thanks.